friend, family member, co-worker, podcast, or TED Talk, the message seems to ring clear that we are stuck in the mud and we need to pull out of it. While I may not be in K-12 through and experiencing these issues in the same way, there's no doubt that education as a whole feels these pains. This was illustrated clearly to me only last year when I was looking at a bookshelf that housed a book on our failing public schools shoulder to shoulder with a book on our failing colleges. Now every system on every level is struggling. As a college educator, I see similar issues permeate my institution. Grant Lichman, in his 2013 TED Talk entitled, What 60 Schools Can Tell Us About Teaching 21st Century Skills, mentions three deterrents to change in the current system. Anchors, which is the need to control our time and space, dams, the massive buildup of content requirements, and silos, the separation of individuals and content. Now, I see this so very clearly in my institution. I work for a community college in the state of Illinois. If you don't already know, there are a great deal of political and financial strife in Illinois that kind of batters at our schools, leading to cracks in the foundation or even wiping out of institutions altogether. Now, Mr. Lynchman mentions politics a few times when referring to those drivers of problems and also that which restricts change. I would have to agree with him here and note that my school is no different. While politics have occasionally aided us, for example, the development of a new building, it has also led to fear, which in turn leads to grasping of those aforementioned anchors. Both faculty and administration become adversarial as most do when feeling threatened. Now, while these anchors are Certainly in place, I don't fear that all is lost. While I've always been sort of dumbfounded by the amount of time it takes for change to be implemented in the college system, which I lovingly refer to as, quote, academic time, they happen nonetheless. Now, to be fair, it's hard to see the true size of the changes from up close, you know, only looking back a few months to even a year. But if you step back, it's truly amazing how far we've actually come. Now, just take online education, for example. It was not that long ago that full-time employees or parents would have been unable to attend my school regardless of whether or not they could afford it. They simply could not get to campus. Now we have full degrees that can be achieved from your home. Along those same lines, these degrees may have started out rough and tangled, but they grow more and more rigorous and powerful in their own right as technology and experience advance. Now, it seems we as an educational culture are struggling to make needed changes. As Lichman mentioned, we see these changes as, quote, hard, and in a way we fear them. However, there are a few brave souls out there that push on nonetheless and strive to make the changes that are needed, regardless of those anchors, dams, or silos. While I do not see any of the arguments as far-fetched in any way, I do think that we are seeing a call to action start to break the surface. Educators across grade levels, positions, and institutions are seeing the concrete wall of the status quo of this industrial age beginning to crack, and innovation is beginning to seep through. Maybe in a few years, the restraints will break altogether and an explosion of change and growth will occur. Now, a strong, successful relationship in any circumstance relies on tools and methods that work in tandem to foster growth. What is professional development but a relationship between teachers and progress? This relationship honestly requires thoughtful consideration of attributes that best make up a good partnership, leading to growth for faculty and students alike. Penuel, Fishman, Yamaguchi, and Gallagher in 2007 identified a series of attributes for professional development that allow teachers to be successful in both preparation and implementation of the content. I see these attributes of professional development in two distinct categories of content and relational focus. Each can potentially foster that growth and satisfaction so strongly needed in any effective relationship. 
Now, the first of the two categories is what I would call content focused. These would include attributes of reform orientation, duration, and focus. Each of these center around the fundamental purpose and design of professional development. In order for the design to be successful for teachers, it must be reform oriented. Penuel et al. states that training should be in close proximity to teacher practice. The goal of PD then should be to create transferable skills for faculty. Now, another content attribute is the focus of professional development. While it's been debated as to whether PD should focus on student or teaching skills, in reality, it's both that is needed. In the field of online education where I focus my attention, it's not only how to use the tools available, but why they should be used. And finally, it's not only the content itself, but the delivery length of the content. The traditional one day quote sit and get workshop has lacked results for our students. Why should it be any different for adult learners? Professional development has been proven most effective when done over a long time span or in multiple cycles, according to Penuel et al. These attributes combine to streamline the content created and implemented in professional development training. Now, while the category of content focus is important, it's only one half of a whole. In addition to content, we must also see the relational focus of professional development. How do we relate to our teachers and consider them when designing and implementing various programs? Again, Penuel et al. consider this clearly. We must consider teacher participation, engagement, and coherence. Participation in PD should be collective in nature. The, build, the building of relational trust in both content and relationships and considering this in implementation is vital. Next to this is engagement. Not only must we encourage collective participation, but also promote active engagement in the content. We know that our students find success in hands-on and practical immersion in their content. We have to apply that same idea to our workshops and learning circles. Finally, the coherence of content to the needs and demands of districts or individual schools is key. Every relationship needs different things, and what works for one may be impossible for another. Therefore, individual learning and application is crucial. Each of these attributes connected together to form a fairly strong model for professional development is what we need to focus on. However, these attributes continue to show promise. They are a deviation from tradition. It can be difficult for faculty and administration to step away from what we know and onto a new and unfamiliar path. Changes seem to occur kind of rapidly in education, and that can lead to resentment towards change in general. For this reason, among others, it can be easier to stick with the familiar and sort of balk at the new. Considering this, it's important to reflect on the benefits of the aforementioned attributes. Engaging, in our, teacher, engaging our teachers in collaborative learning that directly impacts their circumstance and leads to reform can help to navigate us away from the fear of change. A video entitled Effective Professional Development Enhances and Promotes Student Learning highlights a key perspective that I think sums up how we should consider change. You cannot, quote, learn in four years everything you need to know as a teacher. We must continue to engage in leaning, learning new teaching skills and interacting with our content in a way that leads to excitement in the classroom. As Brian Tracy, CEO, keynote speaker, and seminar leader said, quote, those people who develop the ability to continuously acquire new and better forms of knowledge, that they can apply their work and their lives will be movers, in their lives, they'll be movers and shakers in our society for the indefinite future. Now there needs to be a rethought in the way we look at and manage professional development. Across the board, we hear statements declaring a need for greater research and funding. Why Darlingham and Adamson 
in 2010 state that higher quality documentation of the types and values of various forms of PD along with greater focus on the funding of successful programs is key. Similar to this, Killian and Hirsch declare that thoughtful and collaborative professional development should be investigated aggressively. Killian and Hirsch also state that there's no way around it. To achieve the vision of Common Core Standards, the nation and each state need to not only change their approach to professional learning, but also invest more in it. It seems that there's a desire to promote additional research, but firmly state that PD, such as the sit and get one shot approach, are not effective and as of yet proven useless by research. Instead, we should be exploring the use of extended trainings, collaborative and content-focused experiences, and an exploration of the use and viability of technology-enhanced PD. It seems that the professional development needs and desperate wants of our instructors are pretty much universally agreed upon. And one of the most prevalent themes I noticed in research is the idea of scholarship of teaching and learning. Burke in 2013 states that the comprehension and utilization of theory and research in our classrooms is necessary in order to be effective teachers. As a faculty at a two-year institution, I find myself sort of struggling to achieve this goal of scholarship in my field. Now, the typical focus of two-year colleges is teaching over research. In fact, at times you can even feel discouraged from pursuing research as it is seen as a deterrent to classroom preparation, time, and energy. And I feel somewhat like the little kid that just passed the candy shop window and is trying desperately to see what is inside while simultaneously being pulled away by the parent to the next, quote, errand. In the article, 10 Good Ways to Ensure Bad Professional Learning, which was written in sarcasm, uh, perception is noted that it seems that instead of immersing ourselves in scholarship of teaching and learning, we are quickly jumping from topic to topic each semester without any regard for what is gained in past terms. Add to this the rather heavy teaching load that is common in two-year colleges and you find yourself in a difficult situation. It seems as if opportunities for immersion in scholarship would provide a great deal of benefit to faculty and institutions in the form of teacher retention. I like the suggestion briefly mentioned by Burke to give teachers the resources they need, both in the form of time and freedom of choice, to explore scholarship of teaching and learning as well as within their own content fields. I'm hoping that this may soon be a possibility at my institution with the recent relaxing of the definition of, quote, faculty development. Maybe I'll get a little bit more time to see what is in the candy store window and subsequently develop my identity as a teacher. Now, one thing to consider is that the concept of the development and maintenance of an identity for seasoned teachers is obviously impacted when they take on the role of mentor. Now, while identity is an ever-changing and malleable prospect, it is something that is greatly impacted not only by personality, but also by environment. In the article, Balancing Mentoring and Collaboration, we read about three mid-career teachers who transitioned to a mentoring role at their institution. Now, each came to their role through various paths and achieved their mentoring goals in different ways. Now, throughout the discussion, it seemed a common theme examined was the mentorship role's impact on the identity of each seasoned teacher. The author of the study soon discovered that the act of peer mentoring alters the identity of those in the role and requires a sort of balancing act between the leadership role and the commonly expected collaborative role most recently desired. Ideally, there would be plenty of opportunity for gatherings of mentors to discuss, vent, and connect. Overall, it does seem that identity is often fluid when a seasoned teacher transitions to a position of mentorship. Now, the statement by Musanti in 2004 that, quote, schools are transformed by teachers assuming new roles is absolutely accurate. 
we must provide these seasoned teachers with the support needed with this in mind. Now the article Effective Mentoring, a case for training mentors for novice teachers, highlights the need for effective mentoring of those novice teachers. Issues such as retention of teachers in education and teaching effectiveness were addressed. The authors emphasize the significant benefits of experienced mentors to provide social, instru instructional, and logistical support to new faculty. However, these mentors needed to be situationally similar to the novice teachers and properly trained in order to be effective. The author specifically mentioned a need to make a link between generations in the process. This article, though focused on traditional K-12 teaching, can also be applied to mentorship in very specific fields such as online education. Generational links are certainly prevalent here. Uh, a large technological gap between generations can lead to distinctly different perspectives. The difference could actually be a benefit in that the various generations can learn from each other through the mentoring process. Ideas generated by the novice teacher can be honed and guided through that mentor. And unfortunately, a typical practice in many traditional schools that add online components is to ask instructors to create an online class and offer little, if any, aid in the course building process, let alone in the maintenance and instructional process. If aid is provided, it is usually in the form of the learning management system training and not ongoing help or pedagogical guidance. While LMS training is helpful, it still leaves the new online teacher walking a narrow path alone. Mentoring programs would be incredibly useful to institutions that begin online course offerings. Mentoring alone could offer a major difference between the success and satisfaction of students and instructors. It's with this opportunity that we may truly experience diversity that melds into cohesion. Now, diversity is a popular topic in all educational settings right now. The concept of multiculturalism in professional development is actually quite important. What one might find interesting is that when, quote, diversity training is conducted, it looks quite different from institution to institution and also from year to year. At my own institution, we have various faculty development opportunities centered on diversity, and they range drastically in their focus from disability to racial tension. And as stated in her TEDx speech, Claire Potter shares with us how the term diversity is coded differently by different institutions. I would add to that by saying that the coding also differs with the atmosphere of the institution at a given point in time. For example, Copenhagen Johnson in 2007 mentions that when No Child Left Behind began, there was a push to engage all children and all faculty. It was as if there was an attempt to wipe out traditional connotation definitions of diversity in order to, quote, meet the needs of all children. The differences that we all possess were ignored in favor of a one size fits all perspective. While NCLB was not a specific focus for higher education, it certainly played its role. It seems that during that time frame, faculty development was focused on universal teaching methods and classroom management techniques. As the years advanced, we saw a lack of progress, and in many cases, we actually saw harm occurring from the NCLB. Colleges seemed to shake things up and transition to faculty development centered on a re-embracing of the traditional definition of diversity. Now there's an attempt to offer faculty development training in a variety of specific diversity-related topics. One year we had a great deal of regulation change and increase in those registered as having a disability and faculty felt unprepared for this and called for help and shortly after this we found ourselves in the midst of the Ferguson shooting and riot if you recall that. This led to diversity training in ethnic and occupational sensitivity. Specific topics uh, in the definition of diversity were getting their own sessions. While this is a positive in its own way, I wonder if there is something significant missing here. Are we so focused on training teachers how to deal with diversity that we actually further polarize ourselves? 
Ramirez, in his article entitled, entitled Ethnic Minorities in Teaching in 2009, shared that programs encouraging diversity in the educational system are abundant, yet were not successful in encouraging a variety of people to enter the field and offer their perspectives. I wonder if it's not that we lack volume or variety in diversity training, but if we're looking at diversity with too sharp of a microscope. What if we zoom out a little and see multicultural training as an opportunity to learn from each other and reduce previous levels of ethnocentrism? It is an abstract thought, but if we can change our perspective a bit and focus on the needs and passions of individuals and connecting them to each other, then maybe the polarization will fade a bit and a new integrative mindset can surface. Finally, change. Change is one of those words that means something different to each person and at different times in their lives. In the world of education, change happens frequently and is viewed in about as many different ways as it occurs. It's not a surprise then that there are many that have become resistant to change, even when it's by all accounts positive. In some cases, teachers have been so bombarded with change in their institutions that they've either become numb to it or feel the need to fight against it in order to save some form of control. Borco 2013 shares in the article Professional Development and Teacher Learning Mapping the Terrain that the research that exists in the world of PD and the need for change that we are experiencing right now is everywhere. Through three phases, Borco explored how we approach research in PD and what changes need to be made in order to make this process more effective. Now the question may not be what changes we need, but where should they come from? It seems like the typical response to change is to add new ideas on top of old ones. I wonder if we must first address the excess that currently exists before we add anything else. In the 1995 book Tinkering Toward Utopia by Tayak and Cuban, we find that more often than not we are piling on the new without trimming the old and ineffective practices. What if we first remove what is not working and instead engage in the resources we already have? Now one major reason for resistance to change is when we feel as if we're not involved in the decision-making process. Authors Shrum and Levin in 2013 share a very thoughtful perspective when they say that teachers know what they need and should be allowed to articulate it and implement the changes. In many ways, our teachers need what our students need. We desire a chance to be involved in the process of our own education and to be creative with those experiences. The producers of a video entitled Wise Voices Embrace Change in Education explain in their motivational promotion that we should embrace the creativity possible from all students, adults and children alike. This is what's needed now, not straight knowledge. Teachers know what they, as students, need. They can articulate it, self-teach it, and then share it with others. Why not consider this as a perspective on professional development? Ask teachers to explore what they want to know more about, test it, and then share their experience, and aid in the professional development in that topic. It seems that the intrinsic reward of being involved in change and impacting it personally would be more than enough to motivate our teachers to embrace change rather than fight it. <laughs>